Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for today's virtual education meeting. Today, we are going to focus on lessons from around the world. We've had a lot of interest in what's going on in schools in other countries. And we have with us today two experts who are going to give us a little bit of insight into how they're managing their school systems during the pandemic and what we might glean from that and what lessons we might learn. Just as a reminder, the protocols for today's virtual meeting are listed there. Um, first of all, please join us by video. Um, please don't shut off your video screen. We love to see your faces. It definitely makes it feel more like an in-person meeting. And um, also be sure to type your full name in your tile in your box. Um, we wanna make sure that we know who's available and who is joining us. You can do that by clicking on the three dots in the upper right hand corner of your tile and just rename yourself with your full name in your state or your organization that you represent. Make sure that you keep yourself muted. And we also um, are gonna invite you to participate in the discussion and ask questions. You can either do that by virtually raising your hand, typing your questions in the chat box, or also, um, uh, just unmuting yourself and asking for those questions. Please make sure that you don't share your screen any, under any circumstances. Uh, that's just for those of us who are presenting. And just a reminder that the meeting will be recorded and it is archived on our website. The link is there on that slide. And we will also include a number of other resources. Um, our speakers just shared they have additional resources they'd like to share with you that just have come out in the past 24 hours or so. So we want to make sure that you have access to those as well and we'll make sure those are included. So I'm gonna go over the agenda for today's meeting. First of all, um, I'm gonna introduce our speakers and then they're gonna talk with us about the lessons that we're learning from school systems around the world in this pandemic. But before we get started, I am going to ask you to respond to a couple of questions. Let me get the poll launched here. So attendees, um, should be viewing the questions. Um, the first one is, how would you rate your level of understanding of what's happening in education in other countries during this pandemic? One would be, I have not read or heard much about this. Three is, I've heard a bit, but not exactly sure how they are handling education. And five, I have heard and read quite a bit about this. And then the second question gives you an opportunity to indicate what are your most um, important areas of interest with regard to how other countries are addressing the pandemic. So I'm just going to give you just a few seconds to respond to the poll and then I will give you the results. So just so you know, most folks are saying that they've heard a little bit about it but aren't exactly sure how it's being handled. So this will be a great opportunity for our speakers to be able to share additional information and fill in some of those gaps for you. And then most respondents are wanting to know about how they handle distance learning, um, whether and how they're planning to go back, what were their biggest successes for, um, that we can potentially learn from, and um, if and how they close schools. So I'm going to close the polling and I'm going to sh quickly share the results with all of you. Just take you, give you a few seconds to take a look at those. All right. So with that, I am going to um, introduce our speakers. I have had the great pleasure to be partnering with the National Center for Education and the Economy um, for, gosh, almost six years now, when we launched our effort to dive really deeply into international comparisons with a group of state legislators and legislative staff who have become known as our International Education Study Group. And we released our report, No Time to Lose, which we will also include as a resource as well for your reference, uh, where state legislators 
studied as much as they could, learned as much as they could from international experts and concluded what they thought were the top four elements that they found, common elements that they found in the highest performing education systems and how that might be translated for our work here in the US. Um, today we have joining us Nathan Driscoll, who is the Associate Director of Policy. Nathan has been with us on that entire journey. And we also have joining us Anthony McKay, who is the CEO and President of NCEE. And uh, Tony was definitely involved throughout part of it because he was working as a consultant at the time and was doing some pretty deep work in Kentucky, actually, to um, make some changes based on international comparisons. And now Tony is the um, new CEO and president of NCEE. Tony is joining us from Australia and it's 5 a.m. there. So <laughs> please be sure to thank him for getting up early and uh, sharing his time with us. So with that, Nathan, I'm going to stop sharing my screen so you can begin to share yours. Um, I am getting a notification that I am not permitted to. Oh, we had this happen last time too. Let me, if you guys want to go ahead and get started, let me work on this from my end. Okay, um, Tony, do you want to kick us off with a few remarks? I will indeed, and thank you, Michelle, very much. Um, hi, colleagues, great to be with you. Uh, <laughs> and as Michelle said, uh, it's, it's uh, early in the morning. It's not so much early in the morning, it's more that uh, Nathan and I uh, have just been involved in uh, the 10th uh, of the International Summits on the Teaching Profession. Uh, so Arnie Duncan launched the International Summit on the Teaching Profession in New York City 10 years ago. And uh, it came, Michelle, as a result of the then Secretary of Education attending an OECD activity in Paris where they sat around a room which is as big as a football field uh, with their own separate microphones and they each had a particular time allocation for making a contribution and he thought that it was uh, less than consistent with the principles of good learning. So <laughs> he said, let me host an activity in New York in which we bring together ministers of education and teacher union leaders and have a real dialogue about teacher policy that could really advance our collective work. So we've just had the 10th gathering, which uh, colleagues was a virtual gathering for obvious reasons. Um, and it involved uh, something of the order of uh, 20 jurisdictions, 20 countries, all of whom are OECD countries within the OECD. And um, we had a three hour seminar that, uh, concluded about three hours ago. So Michelle, uh, the question about uh, early in the morning is now something that I'm not clear about. I'm not absolutely convinced <laughs> that I know what time of day it is. So, <laughs> however, it does mean that uh, as we enter this conversation today, it is fresh from the conversation of ministers, uh, education union leaders, and many observers uh, from around the globe who are part of the OECD uh, country network. And so I'm going to bring you just a couple of messages from that very forum. And as you've said, uh, Michelle, we'll circulate a couple of documents that have just been released, two reports that go to the very heart of the focus of our attention today. But just before I do that, um, let me just say a, a quick word about the National Centre on Education and the Economy. As you pointed out, we are very close friends and colleagues and have been working together now for a number of years and the poll that you've just taken indicates that whilst there is both a familiarization or at least some familiarity uh, with the international work that is going on it's often I think through agencies like OECD, UNESCO, the United Nations, World Bank, whole range of other uh, connections that people will have uh, on this call. Obviously legislatures uh, across the country have got their own networks and relationships uh, with other jurisdictions. And I know that people are obviously globally connected. We have been wanting to make sure that that 
connection is one that's been made systematic through our research and analysis over 30 years. So what can we learn from high performing education systems uh, across the globe? And of course, as soon as I say that, the definition of high performing tends to at the moment be associated with uh, the PISA uh, results that we have every three years that are administered across OECD countries around uh, literacy and numeracy science and now a range of other innovative domains uh, testing at the age of 15, which gives us a, a snapshot. And then of course, we have uh, what I guess are trends now that we've been uh, administering PISA over the best part of 20 years it means that uh, we've got a lot of information about how young people are faring across these jurisdictions according to a particular set of metrics. And we've been wanting to try and analyze the features of these high performing education systems and to analyze it in ways that can be applicable uh, to the US, to states and districts across the US. Now, as soon as I say that, obviously, as No Time to Lose uh, has argued, you do not do some kind of rough translation from uh, other contexts with different cultures, with different histories, with different politics and different social conditions, and believe that that translation can be appropriate uh, within a, a US context. But there are common features which are appropriate. And of course, No Time to Lose was a report uh, that identified exactly those common elements and argued strongly for an approach to the way in which we tackle our own work here in the US to be a system oriented approach. Now, as soon as we talk about systems, we're talking about uh, what I think were identified as being the key features. And I won't go through those in any detail, except to say, we know that if we're going to have a high performing system, we need to tackle it from the early years through to what we see as being the crucial transition from the more senior years of high school through to further study and work. And before COVID-19, the argument would have been, how do you get the highest performing learning system that will graduate young people, as we have always talked about as being college and career ready. Now we're actually saying, of course, college and career ready, we're talking about life ready. And I think that most people understand now that as we think about the challenges that we were facing pre-COVID, they were immense. We were talking about a much more complex and uncertain environment, and we were talking about entering into more fully an AI world. Well, if you add that together with some of the issues that all of us were confronting about sustainability and the UN Sustainable Development Goals, that obviously have a set of objectives that will take us through to 2030, that raise serious questions about our sustainability. And now we have the crisis, the pandemic. There really is a sense in which I think that learning, if it hasn't been centre stage, is centre stage. And if you think about all that we are confronting today, right here on our doorstep, across states, across cities, the level of disruption, the level of concern that we have for the fabric of our society, then it is going to be our learning system, to use that language, that will give us the strength and the courage and give us a way in which we believe we'll be able to make not only our own place here uh, sustainable, but obviously we want a sustainable planet just to lift the odds. Now, all I'm wanting to put, point out here is that I think we can learn from each other. And if we've ever known that we've been connected, we know it now. We know it because of COVID-19. We are absolutely connected uh, across our own jurisdiction, but uh, across the geographies. So we're hoping that the work that we've been doing with you and will continue to do uh, with NCSL will mean that we can design learning systems that will be more adequate and more fit for purpose. Obviously, we have um, two major objectives at the National Centre on Education and the Economy. And note, it does combine education and the economy. It is the future of learning and the future of work that all of us know is going to be so vital. One of the, one of the uh, focus areas for us, of course, is how can we ensure that we use that knowledge to prepare leaders 
who can take forward this work at every level across the system. Uh, obviously in classrooms, in schools, in districts, in states and nationally. And so a lot of our work uh, is in the area of uh, executive development, of how we can ensure that we have got leaders of learning that will really make sure that our systems are fit for purpose. The second, of course, is actually what we were doing with uh, you, Michelle, and all of those who joined us for the first cohort uh, of uh, the NCSL study, No Time to Lose. And that is about getting policies into place that we believe will really make a difference. I guess many people on this call will know that uh, we've been working in different states and districts in relation to both leadership and in relation to policy work. Maryland is probably the most recent and the most advanced in terms of applying all of the elements of what we see as high performing systems. Uh, but we know other states are absolutely moving in that direction. So we are delighted about our partnership, obviously, and uh, the potential for an ongoing uh, partnership that will mean that more and more of us are sharing this work. And by the way, when I say sharing, I mean co-creating the work. Uh, this is not something where you just simply bring a formula. This is something where everybody on this call knows that we would need to do this together and we are doing it together. So look, uh, let me just say two other th quick things and then pass to Nathan. Um, coming from that forum uh, of international uh, experience, there were some 36 countries that have just undertaken a major survey and I will send that report to you. Uh, and it's, uh, it's one that has been undertaken in cooperation between OECD, um, Harvard, uh, the World Bank. Uh, it's just been released. It's called Schooling Disrupted, Schooling Rethought, How the COVID-19 Pandemic is Changing Education. And given the way in which people responded to your questions, it goes to the very heart of all of those questions. And there's another report that I'll also circulate uh, that uh, has been released by Education International. Um, and that is, of course, uh, the organisation that is the is the meta organization for every education union across the globe. So this is the special relationship. And I wanna just uh, point out uh, a couple of things that have emerged as the principles under which we should see the reopening of schools. And we know by the way that the language that people have used has been fascinating because some have talked about the suspension of classes. That's the language you hear in Singapore. And others of course have talked about school closures. So the question about what is the extent of reopening depends upon what was the extent of closure. And uh, I'll say something more depending upon the nature of the questions and Nathan's presentation that we are now learning from each of these 36 countries that have been surveyed. That what are their plans about reopening? What do they uh, see as being the absolutely essential questions around health and safety and well-being? What do they see as being the strategies that will help them to ensure that the support for teachers is there and that the instructional resources are there? So all of that we can talk about, and Nathan will, in uh, relation to a number of jurisdictions. But let me just say this as I pass over to Nathan. There are five areas that Education International identified, and they're worth just thinking about. As we go to reopening in whatever form, and we know now that we're not going back to the old normal. Whatever language you want to use, <laughs> the new abnormal, the new normal, whatever it is, we know that there's going to be elements here of hybrid and blended approaches. And so the concern about digital online distance learning is going to continue to be crucial. But we need to do that in a way where we believe that it is educationally sound, that learning will take place, and that the pedagogies that are associated with it will ensure that we get deep learning. Otherwise, people are arguing this is going to be a substitute for something less adequate than classroom learning. But the five points that this survey has made clear. One, don't do this without engaging in serious dialogue. And that means serious dialogue with families, with the community, with the profession, with government. All of those parties need to be involved in this conversation. Two, ensure the health and safety 
of the education communities that you are reopening. And on that score, we know that in fact, the World Health Organization has identified six conditions. I'll circulate this as well, but you will have known them. I'm not going to spend too much time on them now, but obviously that everything from our absolute confidence that we have got the transmission of disease under control, that we've got health systems that detect, test, isolate and treat every case and trace every contact, that hotspots are minimised, that schools and workplaces have established preventative measures, that the risk of importing new cases can be managed and the communities are fully educated, engaged and empowered. Uh, and then let me just say uh, that there are three other areas that people are identifying. Make equity a top priority. The thing that's been revealed across every jurisdiction is that we didn't just have fault lines around equity, we have fractures. We don't just have fractures, we've got chasms. Let me give you one statistic that came from a survey that was done here in Australia just last week. We thought we had between 15 and 20% of young people at the age of 15 in categories of what we would regard as being vulnerable or at risk. We've identified 35 to 40%, double the number who are at risk. Now that actually is the revelation that to some extent has been hidden. We've always understood that equity is the big game, but this COVID-19 has revealed that in ways that you simply cannot escape. And we know now what the consequences are of that continuing situation for our social and emotional, physical uh, well-being, quite apart from economic prosperity. Fourth, support physical and emotional well-being and recovery. And a quick word to say, everybody's been preaching the gospel of social and emotional learning. It's been rhetoric. All of these countries are saying they have not been serious about that. Well, actually, I think the US has been serious about this. The intensity of work around social and emotional learning across districts and states in the last four or five years has been probably more intense uh, across the US than it has been many other geographies. But to make it clear that that's a precondition for the kind of cognitive learning that we want. The research is not out, the research is in. We know what the connections are. This is not something that's nice to have. It actually works with uh, academic learning in ways that actually lift the performance of young people and become stronger and, and obviously learners who are going to be committed to ongoing learning throughout their lives. And finally, trust the profession. If there's one thing that came out of the uh, three hours together with 20 jurisdictions from ministers and teacher union leaders, and this was coming from ministers, so secretaries of education, that they have been amazed, and they shouldn't have been, but they have been amazed at the capacity of the profession to respond to this crisis maybe less amazed and more in the territory of, we are absolutely clear about the role of the profession in leading this work. Of course, they need to be supported. Of course, we need to have policies that actually are the conditions for the work that is undertaken. But the profession has actually received the kind of recognition and the status that we have been arguing for for years. Now, that's not to say that we're there, but we do know that the partnership that needs to take place is actually now on display across the US, across states and districts, and across the globe. So with that, I'm gonna to pass to Nathan. Thank you, Tony. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Michelle said, my name is Nathan Driscoll. I worked closely with both Tony and Michelle for many years now. Um, and it is my team's responsibility to take the lessons learned um, that, we, that we are figuring out from all of these high performing systems around the world and translate them for state policymakers in the United States um, to enable them to make policies um, that would allow them to match the best, um, the most excellent um, equitable and efficient systems in the world. So um, today I really wanna talk to you about um, the questions that have been bugging me since um, our uh, workplaces um, and our social spaces shut down about three months ago um, after 
taking the tr transition to full-time distance work, um, taking stock of all of that, our team really came together and asked ourselves how we could be helpful um, in helping policymakers um, really uh, make connections around the globe and learn from what other systems are doing to confront this crisis. And we asked ourselves three questions, and I think there are three questions that are relevant for this group today. Um, first, uh, how many of the high-performing systems closed? How did they handle that? Um, and then why and how did they decide to reopen? What were the conditions they used and what were the, the best practices that they used? Um, but in asking that question, what we really were faced with the realization of was that, um, as Tony said, distance learning um, is not going to go anywhere long term forever. Um, mandates around social distancing are going to ensure that students are going to be learning from home in some circumstances into the fall. Um, and we really needed to do a lot of not just just in time work, but also work over the course of the next year to help school systems be prepared for what that looked like. So um, we asked ourselves, have other countries been more successful in transitioning to distance learning, specifically the high performing systems that NCE focuses on? Um, and we found out um, through a range of metrics that I'll talk about that the answer was yes. Um, and given that the answer is yes, what features enabled them to be better prepared? Um, and then third, um, what, in what ways are high performing systems taking stock of um, education for the future in the midst of this pandemic? Um, one of the mantras that we really started hearing as we were working with systems around the globe was, um, as tough as this is, please never waste the opportunity of a good crisis. Um, and there are, I would not say that there are lessons learned because no one knows the answers yet, um, but there are emerging principles for what education can look like in the future that this pandemic has begun to show us. Um, so uh, in terms of flow, I'm going to take the first two of these topics um, and then just to maybe break it up for a little bit so I don't talk at you for too long, I might ask Michelle to come in and let me know if there are any burning questions on the table and then return to the third. Um, so first question, um, why reopen and how? Um, the first of these two questions may seem really laughably obvious to folks. Um, there are a lot of people that are itching to get back to school right now, but I think it's worth acknowledging um, the ways in which this pandemic has reaffirmed the value of place-based schooling, even as it has challenged us to think differently about the future. So um, I'm gonna run through these very quickly, but Schools are uh, a major tool in our toolbox to drive towards the goal of equity. Um, they serve as social service hubs, they serve as community centers, they serve as places where students can be safe and warm and get warm meals and build trusting relationships with adults. Um, and they help to um, they also help to inculcate all students, not only those that face severe disadvantages, um, into, um, into social settings. Um, they enable young people to play and disagree and debate and um, learn to reach consensus and work in teams. Um, they promote strong pedagogy. One of the things that we're seeing is that there is a lot of really exciting work going on around the world um, to use technology to promote learning in really exciting ways in virtual environments. Um, there are ways that parents can be engaged to promote learning in the home or in community settings that are very exciting. Um, but there are also subjects and grade levels um, and skills and topics that are best handled by a teacher working with students. Um, and I, I think that's really caught, this pandemic has really caused all of us around the globe to take stock of which, um, of which is which. Um, schools are places that measure readiness, and this is uh, this shorthand encompasses a few different kinds of things. Um, they enable experts to assess whether students are qualified to move on to the next level of education. Um, they enable experts to assess whether teachers need help or are prepared to be teaching the skills that they are teaching effectively. Um, and they enable entire systems to measure system progress um, in, in ways, um, uh, you know, in, in congregations that are really important um, for assessment. So 
these are not things that can, you can replace. And, and last, um, you know, we are the National Center on Education and the Economy. We've been talking about the intersection of education and our economic system for a long time now. I never thought I would have to say that um, this has really made us think about how schools are invaluable for letting parents work. Um, even those parents who are privileged enough to be able to um, work from home 100% of the time cannot monitor and support learning and do, do their jobs in ways that are effective. So knowing that schools had to reopen, um, and I, sh I should emphasize that all of the high performing systems that we look closely at did close in some fashion for some length of time, although that length of time varied. Um, what are the promising practices that we're seeing to enable them to reopen safely? And, and, and these are more general principles, I suppose. But all systems have been prioritizing certain groups of students um, and enabling them to go back into the classroom first. Which student groups those are varies a little bit depending on the jurisdictions. Um, but they include students that are most disadvantaged, which could mean low income students, migrant students, um, second language learners, um, or students who teachers have identified as not being, as being quote unquote hard to reach, uh, which is a term I, I don't think we love, but, um, but students who have not been attending virtual learning sessions. They've also been prioritizing students with specific needs that may be less obvious to those of us on this webinar. Um, uh, many have prioritized uh, career technical education students because they recognize that certifying skills in the workplace actually requires a form of work-based learning to go to. Um, others have prioritized or, uh, students in early childhood settings um, or students who are at key transition points. So um, students who need to pass graduation exams in order to qualify for attendance to university um, will go back sooner than others. Um, systems are Pairing that form of prioritization of learning for certain student groups with creative scheduling. So almost all are having either students go, one group of students go in the morning and one go in the afternoon, or students um, alternate Tuesdays, Thursdays, um, Mondays, Wednesdays. Um, that's true across all systems. And many systems are looking at new uses of space um, and out of classroom learning. Sometimes that means virtual. Um, sometimes that means thinking creatively about what forms uh, or what subjects is a form of pedagogy that uses a large scale lecture hall um, actually appropriate for high school students. There may be some cases where that is appropriate and we can use that. Some are partnering with communities, um, community spaces to hold schools um, in those spaces. But the headline here and the implication of these three promising practices is really that distance learning we know is going to continue for some group of students into the fall and probably throughout the next year. Um, and we know that not just because many students will be alternating days, um, but also because the reality of the pandemic means that there will be schools um, that have cases that need to have students isolate. Um, there will be spikes. Um, and so there will be a need to think really creatively across the summer about how we can better prepare US teachers um, to use technology to promote distance learning. Um, so that led our team to ask ourselves, um, what are the features of high quality distance learning systems around the world that enable them to be high quality um, that US policymakers could learn from? Um, first, um, and this is probably the most familiar to a US audience, um, is that all of these systems have hubs for learning materials and data platforms to enable them to track student data. What does distinguish these systems is that those hubs are centralized. Um, so they follow students over the course of their career. They're managed by one agency. They're not managed by individual schools or school districts. Um, these systems, um, all have common curriculum frameworks with clear learning goals. Um, and anyone who has read the No Time to Lose report, or if we have any participants from the study group on this call, um, will be very familiar with this concept. Um, what's key is that those learning goals enable every teacher to have a shared understanding of, of where their students should be going, but they also suggest very specific activities for every learning goal um, for every class, um, and those activities can be online and offline. Um, these frameworks are not written to a level of specificity that teachers are required to use one set of materials, but they do provide teachers with a toolkit um, 
and a very clear indicator of what is appropriate to um, where it is appropriate to use online tools, what online tools the system experts have determined are best and which are less effective. Um, related to that, they have very clear standards for curating the digital learning materials, whether that's worksheets or something as advanced as simulated science experiments online. Um, teachers know what learning materials they can use um, that has been determined to be directly linked to their curriculum frameworks and be of high quality to meet a specific target. Um, they are not navigating a marketplace of thousands of tools with no clear objective. And when you take these three bullets um, together, um, there's a sort of meta theme that emerges from them, which is that in the highest performing education systems, teachers were forced to transition to um, full-time use of materials that they had previously been using some of the time. And they were selecting those materials that they knew were best for a distance learning environment. Um, what they were not doing was doing what they would normally do in an in-person classroom setting anyway and moving it directly onto Zoom. Um, because people know that that doesn't necessarily promote um, quality pedagogy. Um, a related policy, um, policy to that is that all of these systems have existing structures and time for distance learning that have already been built into place. So um, in, in some jurisdictions, they call them disaster preparedness days, which is a bit of a funny term to us, but that, um, in others, it's just um, work from home days for kids. But the headline is that for about two to four days per year, every year in these systems, kids have already been going home to work on a self-directed project online with their peers, getting feedback from their teachers, and they're used to that as a form of pedagogy. Um, a related point to that is that there is extensive support for teachers in teaching with technology in these systems. Some of that is training. And some of that has been just in time training for teachers. Um, because even in the highest performing systems, there was no teacher who was 100% prepared to move to distance learning 100% of the time. This has been hard all around the world. And I don't want to imply that it hasn't been. But teachers, once they began working from home, found that they had access to um, digital hubs curated by their peers training materials, um, mentorship from teachers who had been specially designated as experts in various forms of distance learning pedagogies, who they could rely on, um, have Zoom meetings with, collaborate with, and they were given the time to do so. Um, the last point is a possibly very broad and nebulous point to end on um, that in some ways is very rooted in culture, but all of the systems that we work with um, have a deep societal trust in technological infrastructure that underpins their systems. In some cases, that's a function of history. Um, some of you may know we work closely with Estonia that has been a digital hub for decades, um, and they build every aspect of their society around it. Um, but in other cases, that's really a function of policy, and it, it's important. Um, there are very clear standards for how and why student data is used in these systems, and parents and teachers and community members understand those standards, um, as do vendors. Um, there are very, very clear uh, messages communicated to parents about how and why teachers are going to be using student data, or platforms or technological tools that may be unfamiliar and how parents can support that. Um, so there's a really deep abiding trust that has come over the course of a couple of years that technology doesn't need to be the enemy if you build in safeguards that support kids. Um, those are the six key principles that I think are really valuable to focus on. Before I take us to what the future looks like, I did want to give Michelle the opportunity to open it up to the audience and ask me and Tony any questions, if there are any. Uh, let's see, there's just a couple of questions right now. Um, will these slides be available after the meeting? Yes, definitely. We will post them on our website um, where we have a link to the virtual meeting as well as all the resources. 
And then a second question, perhaps I missed it, but is this a survey of OECD country jurisdictions or is it a broader survey of other countries? I think this might go to the countries that you're looking at, Nathan, for the information that you're gathering. Sure. Um, so with the, the countries that we are looking at are 10 of the highest performing jurisdictions in the world, which we measure using a combination of metrics related to high performance on PISA exams, um, equity, equitable learning outcomes, and efficiency. So um, minimal education spending um, correlated with the highest possible results. Um, these are systems that the NCSL International Study Group also studied. Um, they include Finland, Singapore, Estonia, Canada, uh, China, uh, Korea, um, and, and several others. Um, but when I said that we knew that these systems were better prepared to distance learning, I maybe should have paused on that point a little bit. We have data from surveys. Um, there's, there's a range of indicators here, but we know that in these systems, participation rates have ranged generally, um, and I mean daily participation rates in class for students, from 90 to 96%, um, which compared to what the US is seeing right now is, is really stunning. Now, it, it raises the question, what's going on with those 10% of kids? And I, I don't think we can minimize that question, but um, it is showing that these, um, these features are working in getting all students to to participate in their learning. They find it engaging. Um, they've, been, they've become accustomed to it. Um, and these are systems, by the way, that do have um, large migrant and refugee populations, um, second language learners, um, you know, folks living in, in, in pretty serious poverty. So um, they face a lot of the same challenges we do. Um, they've also surveyed teachers' level of comfort with technology and their, and their um, their level of preparedness for the pandemic. And what's interesting is that the vast majority of teachers say they wanna go return to school, um, but the vast majority of teachers also say they felt very well prepared um, and they are comfortable doing the kinds of teaching that's being asked of them um, and, and have the level of support that's necessary to, to do it well. Um, and, and what that says is, is that really blends the two points I think for me uh, that, that I'm trying to make is that, um, School should not go anywhere. Um, there is a lot of value in school and all teachers recognize that, uh, but also there's a lot more that we can be doing to help our teachers succeed. Okay, let's have you continue on. Great. So um, third, the third set of points I wanna make is about how these systems are thinking about the future longer term than just this fall. Um, I said earlier that I didn't want to imply that there were any lessons learned that we had that were concrete coming out of this because um, this is a really uncertain time uh, and I think we need to acknowledge that. But there are ways that jurisdictions are thinking about the future now um, that are different than they were six months ago. And they're thinking about the future in different ways that suggest to us that given that they're already producing students that are two to four years ahead of ours when they get out of high school. Um, if they are thinking about the future in these ways now and we fail to take stock of these possibilities, um, they have the potential to move even further ahead of us. Um, and, and that's a, a really concerning prospect. So um, what jurisdictions are doing um, is taking the opportunity to really seriously assess and address the learning gaps that come out of this. And this is not just immediately in response to the pandemic, although it is that, but it, it's moving forward um, in a systematic way. So, um, you know, as Tony really emphasized, and I think is incredibly important, this pandemic it has exposed all kinds of inequities that were all, always there. Um, it has also exacerbated those inequities for um, the students that don't have access to broadband technologies um, or home environments in which they can reliably log on. Um, other jurisdictions have already built in plans for how they are going to assess the learning gaps that came up over those three months, um, what they're going to do about them, um, and then how they're going to build that ongoing assessment and feedback mechanism into their systems moving forward. So they're seeing this as a real 
opportunity to take stock of their equity challenges in a concrete way. Um, another direction for the future is to um, build virtual learning spaces that are pedagogically appropriate. Um, some of you may be familiar with some uh, really exciting technologies that are out there um, in the augmented reality space or the virtual reality space. Um, what is thrilling about that marketplace is that it enables students to see the world in ways um, that in-person teaching just would not make possible. Um, it, it, you know, it, for augmented reality in particular, it is not possible for a science teacher to do some of the things that they can do now in terms of helping students to see cellular structures or um, the insides, you know, underneath lakes or ecosystems that they could never feasibly travel to. Um, but what's disappointing about this marketplace, I think, is, is that it is a really, in the US and, and to some a lesser extent globally, an incoherent marketplace. Um, the teachers know that these tools are, are there. They're not being tied to any sort of concrete learning goals. Um, and they're not being built out beyond a set of sort of exciting one-time modules that uh, you know, science or history teachers may pick up one time, one time in a student's learning. There's a, a huge opportunity to build out that space if folks are addressing it in, way, in partnership with teachers, um, letting teachers lead it in ways that are pedagogically appropriate. Um, jurisdictions are really being forced to think about <laughs> what matters in terms of curriculum and standards um, and what they really want to measure because that's what matters to them. Um, I don't think it's fair to say that learning during the school, um, during distance learning necessarily needs to be less, um, but it will be more diffuse, um, less, uh, less spiral, less targeted. Um, and teachers are really having to think through, particularly during a crisis, but also moving forward, um, whether they were being asked to teach too much at the expense of helping students to have really in-depth learning experiences that would enable them to master certain skills. Um, so thinking through the priorities in the curriculums that they're setting are, are really key for these jurisdictions moving forward. And also thinking through what they actually need to assess. Um, these are jurisdictions, in, including contrary to some popular narratives out there, places like Finland, uh, that really value assessment as a way to validate student learning and enable them to move on to the next stage of their educational careers or, or into the workplace. But, um, but making sure that the questions are really targeted on what matters most and enabling students to demonstrate mastery through assessment in meaningful ways that will be useful to them moving forward in the workplace in higher education and in life has become more crucial than ever. Um, parent engagement practices have become a huge emphasis in, in high performing jurisdictions. And I think you're seeing that here too. Um, and specifically it's engaging parents, not in the kinds of um, advocacy based activities that we typically think of when we think about parent engagement, but in ways that are central to teaching and learning. Um, they, these jurisdictions are moving from thinking about bake sales and PTAs and helping parents get on board uh, to thinking about how can parents who have jobs themselves be advocates for their kids' learning and supportive of their children's learning in the home. Um, they're redesigning communications tools, they're redesigning homework, uh, they are redesigning curriculum to take advantage of parents um, to think about that question in really systematic ways. Um, Another, another direction for the future is to think about how to validate and recognize learning that happens outside of the school building. Um, it has been uh, uh, sort of something that we've paid lip service to for a while that learning happens in the community, anytime, anywhere. Uh, extracurriculars or co-curriculars are very important, but uh, very few places have really taken stock of um, if we say that learning happens on the sports field or in museums or uh, in cultural activities, what do we actually mean by that? Um, and 
how are we helping students to see that that's important and and actually help validate that if they're engaging in that because that is that is a key part of their educational experience um jurisdictions are paying more than lip service to broader metacog metacognitive skills um this connects in in some ways to tony's uh point about social emotional learning um, but is, is also about helping students to be much more self-directed, to think about how to make themselves more effective learners, um, to uh, be able to get a long-term project, um, identify what it is they need to do it that they don't know, and go out and learn that for themselves. Um, these are the kinds of skills that are necessary for work and for life. Um, and they're the kind of skills that we've been saying for a long time that education needs to focus on. But as we see a lot more creative home-based learning happening, um, we're actually seeing that we need to take it a lot more seriously because that's what students are gonna need to know to manage their own learning. Um, a, a corollary to this, this point, and, and this last one, um, I, I chuckled the first time I heard it in a meeting, but then it, we heard it again and again and again, which was, um, some policymakers in other countries around the world saying it's become really important to us to recognize that some students, not many, not most, but some, have really loved learning during this pandemic. Um, and introverted here is a bit of shorthand. It's not just introverts, but it's, it's students with social anxiety. It's students who have struggled to really manage their time um, during the constraints of a uh, traditional school day focused on learning a topic, producing work uh, to, to validate their learning of that topic in a very specific time frame, engaging in a set of concrete tasks at the teacher's timetable and not necessarily their own. Um, students who have the freedom to design their own timelines um, and work with others in their own ways are sometimes finding that they're much more skilled at that than they thought they were. And um, it would be, it would, I think, behoove all of us and high performing systems are recognizing this um, to help recognize the achievements that they've made and make sure that all of them can thrive as well. Um, so with that, I am gonna cut it off and see if we have any more questions or if Tony would like to add anything else at the end. Um, we do have a couple of questions. Um, one is from Representative Santos from Washington was on our study group, international study group. Um, will you please provide us with a summary of the types of surveys that you use to derive your conclusions? Sure. Absolutely. Um, oh, you're in, well, that's a, <laughs> um, so there are surveys of teachers um, that we have, we have conducted, we have worked with partners to conduct, um, and uh, Education International has conducted as well, and the OECD has conducted as well. Um, there are surveys of policymakers, our partners, um, that we've conducted that are more informal. We've done a lot of focus groups, informal meetings to gather these data. Um, and then there are surveys of um, student participation that jurisdictions have been collect collecting their own data, and then often it's the OECD that's been rolling that up. Um, and we've been working with them to make sense of it as well. I might just add there that uh, the two documents that will circulate are both survey based, Michelle. Uh, and obviously they go beyond the top 10 that Nathan has referred to. They effectively pick up with the OECD Harvard study, 36 countries involved in that survey work. It's a 60 page document, so it's worth a little bit of time. Uh, in relation to Education International, we are talking about surveys across 50, 60 countries. So obviously that is not simply those within OECD countries, uh, but uh, it goes beyond that. Uh, and it goes beyond the highest performing. But I think that the survey data that's now emerging uh, is going to be really instructive. And there's so much of this now. Uh, I noticed the RAND Corporation has just put out a couple of major surveys as well. So maybe in that spirit, uh, Michelle, as we pick up uh, new surveys, uh, obviously you'll be cu curating them yourself, but we can just add perhaps some potentially uh, additional surveys that might be helpful to members. Yes, that would be great. That would be really helpful. I'm sure everyone would love to have access to those resources. 
Um, I don't see any additional questions in the chat box, but I have a couple that others have asked um, me to ask you who couldn't necessarily be on the, the meeting. Um, one is, I think we're hearing a lot about Sweden and how they didn't necessarily close their schools. And how was their experience different from those of us that either had to suspend learning, as you were saying, or to close our schools? Um, I guess I would say very briefly, and, and Tony may have more intel here, um, you know, Sweden is, is not a country that we work all that closely with because it, it does not meet our metrics for high performance. It is a country we have been interested in because they are such an outlier. Um, and I think what we've heard from talking to some folks there um, is that their context for how they think about public policy directives is just really, really different. Um, giving directives there or, or guidance um, from the government is received with a much greater level of trust and a much higher level of social cohesion. Um, I think the specific context there related to the pandemic is, is kind of interesting and I want to be careful from treading on specific public health recommendations because that's not my role. But um, my understanding is that their pandemic has been pretty isolated to a, a small number of um, specific nursing homes um, and they have built in mechanisms to reevaluate when that it, when or if that stops being the case. Um, so yeah, but but um, they, they have managed not to, to close schools um, and, and see um, rates that have been somewhat you know, lower than ours have been, so. Yeah, I just add two things to that, Michelle, that as Nathan has said, I mean, we're talking about uh, actually very different uh, policy responses across the Scandinavian countries, and yet the, uh, the common element is that the social compact and the social partnership between government and uh, the profession is shared. So this is really interesting to try and comprehend because Sweden has been prepared to be uh, uh, less uh, restrictive in the way in which they've thought about shutdown in social distancing rules in the continued opening, not just of schools, but actually of other businesses, uh, obviously of restaurants and other uh, convening places. Now, the, th this is the ongoing debate, of course, uh, within Scandinavia, and um, the, the jury's still out. But in listening to the Swedish minister just a few hours ago, the argument is that there's been a lot of uh, communal effort uh, to minimise uh, the impact. So don't think that Sweden is a free-for-all. That is not the case. They have actually been following uh, guidelines and consensus approaches to the way in which they've dealt with the pandemic. Certainly they've had higher levels of incidence and higher levels of death than other of the Scandinavian countries, but we ought to be very careful to, uh, to avoid uh, a view that says they have just simply allowed this to go without any kind of judgment. That is not the case. It's really helpful. Thank you both for, for chiming in on that. I um, want to give everyone an opportunity to ask one last question. If you have one more question that you want to get answered before we um, end the meeting, please just unmute yourself and jump in. Um, I'm going to switch screens real quick so that I can share with you information about our upcoming meetings. And Michelle, just can I just say one word as you do that, that sure. all of the items on the direction of the future um, that has been shared by Nathan exists in the US right now somewhere. Uh, in other words, we've just had a convening uh, of about 20 different countries in uh, Washington DC virtually. But if I listen to the way in which states and districts have been working in the future already, uh, those features are very much part of the discourse. And in some ways, the innovation in the US is in advance of many other countries. I could give you examples of remake learning, education, reimagine, LRNG, mastery, transcript consortium. All of these are familiar uh, to many people on this call. The thing is that they haven't yet become the system. And I think what Nathan was talking about is, here's a set of directions that you need to think about 
as you redesign your system, not simply as uh, innovations, right? They need to then become quite serious design features if we're going to be able to address the problems that actually have been brought into stark relief through the pandemic. Always such an important reminder that so much of what we hear about is successful in other countries is potentially happening right here. We just haven't um, either identified it as being um, as effective as it potentially could be or we haven't brought it to scale. So thank you, I appreciate that point, Tony. Um, well, thank you both for sharing your time with us. This was, um, as always, so fascinating to hear what's happening in other countries. And we will continue to bring you all this information as we're learning more. We'll continue to be providing updates with both Nathan and Tony um, as we continue through this year. I wanted to remind you about the upcoming meetings we have. As a reminder, this virtual learning series goes to the end of June, and we will be focusing um, on a variety of topics through the remainder of the month. On Friday, we're going to take a little bit of a pause from our um, series to encourage you to join a webinar that's being hosted here at NCSL that's going to be focused on the record unemployment and what's next for state workforces. Um, this is just too good of an opportunity. We wanted to make sure that you have a chance to hear from the um, uh, administration officials who will be joining the call as well as state legislators. I also wanted to mention that this is good preparation for the discussion we go into for the two meetings afterward, which is focused on the biggest sector of workforce in the United States, which is teaching. Um, we know that the budgets and sh this shift has profoundly impacted the teaching profession. And so we will be talking about both recruitment and preparation, how it's been impacted, as well as supports for classroom teachers. Um, on Tuesday, June 16th, we will be focused on guidance for reopening schools in the fall. And then we will um, have a discussion later that week that will be focused on early learning and the impact of the pandemic on early learning. And then we will close out our meeting series with two important virtual meetings, one focused on state revenue forecasts forecasts and um, continued tracking of federal education um, spending and how that is being disseminated within the states. And hopefully there'll be some new news for Austin to share for us about assistance that might be coming down for states by that point. And then finally, we'll be focusing our last meeting on evidence-based policy making. We know that this is a topic that's really critical right now as you're making difficult decisions. So how is it that you can be thinking about finding the best evidence or uh, research to inform yourself about the, dis the, the discussion and the decisions that you're gonna have to make. So we look forward to you joining us um, through the rest of the month for those virtual meetings and we um, thank our speakers for your time today. And with that, our meeting is concluded.